I'm glad we can watch Adam <laughs> as we can see this lecture. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. I know it's early. So today we're going to learn more about neural networks and in particular, a really special type of architecture that we use a lot um, for understanding. It's like Models without the physics is how I think about it. And those are called autoencoders. Before we start, are there any kind of, I'm sure you went home and pondered um, neural networks all night. Are there any questions remaining from yesterday about the concepts of neural networks, not necessarily the syntax of PyTorch? Oh, good. We're all experts. Oh, one last thing, let me get my phone out to make sure I don't run over time too much. Good. Okay, so today autoencoders really think about a different way of thinking of physical problems, although one that you're actually really familiar with, which is this idea of dimensionality reduction. And so one, um, if I were to show you this beautiful light curve of a supernova, which is the explosion of a star, uh, what we generally see are all of these hundreds of data points that represent individual efforts to take a telescope, look at the sky, and then reduce that data. And yet when I look at it with my eyes, I can tell that this is a coherent data set that's telling me a story. In other words, I can use physics to describe the underlying going-ons um, with just a few key parameters. A different way of saying this is that I can fit a physical model to my data set. And that physical model for vanilla supernovae that are really normal looking um, only has a few kind of tunable parameters that I can change. Things like, oh, how much mass was ejected or how much, how much energy did the star have when it exploded or how much of that mass is radioactively decaying so we can actually see the light. So I can summarize these hundreds of data points into just three numbers, and I fully can describe that light curve. Of course, I also very cleverly had to spend a really long time thinking about that physical model and writing it down, right? But as soon as I've done that hard work, then I can summarize my data in these three numbers. And what does that allow us to do? Well, if I just continue on my little supernova thought, one thing I can do is now take this individual object and take the three numbers of the model I fit and create a new, um, what I would call feature space. And so we talked about feature spaces yesterday. We were looking at variable stars um, and we hand engineered different features like periods or amplitudes, and we use that to help us classify those stars. This is the same concept, except these aren't, these aren't really observable features, right? There's something that we don't quite see, but we think are truly driving the observables that we do see. And so now that I have fit one supernova, I can plot it in this new space that I've created. And as I observe more supernovae, I can continue plotting them in this space. And I might see that, oh, they actually cluster really interestingly in this space. I've noticed, this is made up by the way, this is not how this works. But, um, I've noticed that supernovae with uh, hydrogen in their spectrum seem to cluster down here in this space, yet supernovae from white dwarfs cluster in this part. And so when I see this new observation of a supernova in this space, I can do things like classify it into one of these two classes. So in a sense, this space is really telling me about the underlying physics in a, a, a complicated way that maybe we wouldn't otherwise notice had we just been looking at that many, many data points light curve. That's the concept of dimensionality reduction, is that we're going to take our high dimensional space, by that I mean hundreds of data points for a single object, and I'm going to reduce it into just a few numbers, but those numbers are going to be highly interpretable. Um, and I was really weird about language. That's because we don't call this a feature space anymore because I'm not engineering features I see. It's often called a latent space. 
Um, maybe this seems like a silly exercise, but I want you to talk to your partner about like, what does latent mean? And why do you think we're using this term to describe these spaces? Also say good morning to your partner. <laughs> okay, we're gonna come back real quick. Does anyone have an idea why we use the word latent? And the definition of the word latent is a, is a solid way to answer this question. Surely someone can Google it and tell me. <laughs> That's right, thank you. Google says it's hidden or concealed. And that is exactly why we call it a latent space. It is because um, when I look at this light curve, I do not say, ah, the energy is 10 to the 51 Ertz. That's not something I can measure with my eyes. However, I think that the energy and mass are the true intrinsic variables or the physics that are driving this light curve. So it's not something I observe, but it's, I, it's what I think is the, the generative variables creating the data set I see. That's why we often call this a latent feature space um, versus something like a hand engineered feature space. So maybe this point is already driven home. Um, but I really want to emphasize the fact that like we see latent spaces all the time in physics. We just often call them like, I don't know, different like HR diagrams or we call it um, a phase space. But what we're doing is we take observations. So things that are, again, not, maybe this is more, oh, that we see lots of examples in this. And we like just constantly, um, we constantly use these spaces to make physical interpretations. I think Lucienne actually meant, commented this yesterday where people just draw lines on spaces like this and they're like, ah, two physical phenomena are happening. And that's because we really think these latent space, the low dimensional descriptions are where the physics lie. That's why we care so much about doing dimensionality reduction. It's just where our interpretations live. Um, now kind of taking our physics hats off and our machine learning hats on, we can do a number of tasks with these, uh, these dimensionality reduction methodologies. So we've already seen that we can do tasks like classification. In the case of supernovae, it turns out it does work really well to have things like energy and mass as my latent space. But I could also say, hey, in this space, I see a supernova that just ridiculously energetic and really massive. And I could immediately point out that it doesn't look like anything else. So it must be some anomaly or interesting physics. Um, I think that more, the last two or more things Vanessa will touch upon, which is that we can go back and start to integrate some of the physical knowledge we have and interpret data driven latent spaces that we find in our. Um, machine learning methods. Okay, so the way we've talked about latent spaces so far is by fitting a physical model. So like I said, I do the hard work of figuring out how does the physics of an expanding supernova bomb work? What are the driving parameters? And I use that as my latent space. But with neural networks, we said yesterday, kind of one of the whole cool things about it is that you don't need to know all of that. It figures it out for you. So there's a question of how do I actually go about finding low dimensional representations of my data without directly fitting a physical model? There's lots of ways to do this. I like to highlight um, first, one of the kind of classic solutions to this problem, which is a linear solution. And I hope it's clear what we mean by linear um, after the description. So imagine that this isn't labeled, I apologize. You can imagine that it's like um, mass and energy. Well, sure, mass and energy of supernovae. Uh, and they scatter like this. So in this case, uh, there are two, well, there's really clearly one direction where most of the scatter is occurring. And that's where my mouse is highlighting or where the larger little arrow is. And what's kind of interesting is that imagine that for whatever reason, I'm really lazy and I don't want to work with two dimensional data. I just want to work with one dimensional data. Well, one thing I could do is project all of these data points down onto this 
this axis as in this guy. I don't know if you can see him. There's a guy up here. Instead of putting him on this X, Y coordinate, I just say, how far away is this guy from the central point? And that describes the vast majority of the variation I see in this two-dimensional data set, right? And then all the other description um, just comes from this other vector, which you'll notice is orthogonal or perpendicular to my original vector. Um, I don't know if people are familiar. It doesn't, if you aren't familiar with linear algebra, it literally doesn't matter. This talk will not be in those terms, but if you are familiar, I think it's more clear to say it this way. This is um, an eigenbasis of this data set. And I want to point out the fact that, like I said, this two-dimensional data can be exactly described by just changing um, the origin from here to here and rotating the axis from this to this. In other words, I can describe every single data point like this guy up here in this data set by summing some amount of this eigenvector, this arrow, and then some other amount of this eigen eigenvector or arrow. Um, so I would add maybe one length of this and two length of this to describe this guy. It's just, it, it's, it's just a very simple transformation of the X coordinates I'm currently looking at. What we really care about is um, going in higher dimension. So we think that our high dimensional data, like the light curve of supernova, which has hundreds of data points, is only described actually by a few parameters. And so here's a three-dimensional example where what you're supposed to be seeing is basically you see almost like a flat plane that looks like an ellipsis. My like little thing fell off. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, it's an ellipsis. So most of the variation or the diversity or the information all synonyms in this case, is happening in some two-dimensional plane, or we can call it a manifold, um, in the three-dimensional space. And so in this case, having two eigenvectors is actually a pretty solid description of my data. Um, and I do a very small dimensionality reduction by having two vectors instead of three vectors. Are there any questions about that? Of course. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, do you mean this data set in particular or in general? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And maybe um, it's probably just because maybe this isn't a very hey, clear. Hey, sorry, thing. Ashley. Reminder to yeah. oh my gosh, repeat so the question. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. The question is basically there's um, there's some confusion about, um, let's see. It's not exactly intuitively obvious looking at this picture that maybe two vectors would be sufficient for this three-dimensional space. And then more generally, like, how do you know? Is that, that's a fair, okay. So part of the issue might just be that this, maybe this is hard to just to see, but what you should be imagining is it's, um, think about like the plane of the galaxy. This is our galaxy or a circumstellar disk or something. Like it is, you should imagine as largely a, a plate sitting in three dimensions. Yeah. Okay. So, so now that you see that it's, yeah. So the mathematical way of answering your question is that, okay, I can find two vectors lines or planes in which I see most of the variation of my data set. And there's one other dimension where almost no variation is happening. Lack of variation basically means there's no information being given. Now, is this generally true? No. If I have a sphere in this space, there's no clear plane I can draw where I um, have less information. Does that clarify it? Okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, is this scale dependent? The answer is, yeah, definitely yes. Um, and there's a subtlety in that, right? Uh, in general, we try to normalize it. So it really is like the intrinsic scatter that's happening. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Now we have this little gif. <laughs> um, how did I how did I actually choose this most important um, vector or the eigenvector? So if you know linear algebra, I, I did some linear algebra. But this is the 
this is the way I like to visualize it is I can project onto any vector. So these blue points are being plotted smack down onto the, the eigenvector here. Um, and what we are literally looking for is for what angle of this vector do I get the most variation? That will describe what has the most information. Um, so principal component analysis is a, um, it's a way of doing dimensionality reduction. It's a way of building low dimensional models for your high dimensional data set. And the way it works is exactly as we've described. We figure out where the eigenvectors are for the data set, which means first we find the axis with the most variation, and then we find the perpendiculars to that axis, basically. Uh, we hope, well, what we do then is we, in n-dimensional data, um, where we have more than like three of these guys, we figure out, okay, which ones are telling us the most information or describe the most scatter? I'm going to sort those. And then I figure out, and this is kind of a, a domain-specific er, question, which number of eigenvectors is sufficient to describe my data? Where sufficient might mean like at a 10% level, I don't care about supernova properties, but maybe if you're an exoplanet, it's at like a 1% level, I don't care. Um, you, have to, you have to know as a scientist where to stop. Um, so I'm going to project all the data onto these eigenbases, and I'm going to keep track of, I say weights here, by that I just mean, again, the variation along those axes. And it is generally true that um, I will always need n vectors to perfectly describe my data, right? Like if I do no dimensionality reduction, I'm just doing a rotation or some transform in my original space. But the goal is that you don't keep the number. You really want to make sure, or if PCA is working well, the number of vectors that you keep to describe your variations is much smaller than the number you started with. And so this is, again, just driving home the point that our PCA transformations are transforming high dimensional observed space into lower dimensional latent spaces. And just like we said before, we can now use these latent spaces to do physics or other tasks. Here's the issue. PCA is limited to a linear view of the observ observable space. Um, so let's go back, if we remember, there was an example from yesterday of, well, imagine that supernovae for whatever reason in mass energy space, actually, this isn't that bad. It's not the best. Okay, so um, where type ones cluster in a, a circle, and then I don't want to say circle. I think I do like a point, a cluster, and then type twos cluster in a ring around that circle. It's hard for me to choose a basis that naturally that nicely separates them. And this is another good example where, okay, this is two dimensional data. This is clearly, maybe not so clearly, but it is, this is the eigen um, the primary eigen basis, and this would be the secondary. But if you collapse everything onto this, you totally lose the information about this red versus the blue class. And that's just an intrinsic limitation of PCA. Um, a different way of saying this is that you can only make, well, linear cuts in this space, where in two dimensions, linear is literally a line. In higher dimensions, I can only make plane or hyperplane cuts. This is a really hard group question, but I want you to think about what is a real physical example of something that's transforming non-linearly in our observational space with a partner? There's a question, hold on. Yeah, so it's, it's basically what's here. Um, what does it mean to, so here, what does it mean to have a linear transformation of the data to begin with? And then what's an example of physics is being tuned linearly, so you're just monotonically increasing it, but the observation uh, does not change in a linear fashion. So first we have to talk about what does linear, what does it mean to change in a linear fashion? Let's come back 
and this is a really broad question. There's so many ways to interpret this. What is a linear transformation? Well, let's actually just answer question two. What's an example of when I'm tuning some physical parameter linearly, so monotonically, something that we observe is not changing linearly? Yeah. That's a great example. The example that was given was um, when we have a CCD and it's reading in photons converted to electrons, but it gets near the saturation level, uh, the photomultiplier tube freaks out and it's no longer linear. It doesn't really know what to do. That's such a good answer. Yeah. Um, any other examples? Yeah, I think if I follow, maybe I don't. Do you mean physically intrinsically large versus small or like cause? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I see what you mean. Thank you. Okay. So, so the example is, um, imagine for example, I think we live in a different universe in this toy example and that there are two types of galaxies, like dwarfs and, and chunky boys, and there's no in between. Yeah. And so, so one can imagine that there's no clear monotonic jump between the two. There's in fact a gap because maybe two different types of phenomena are happening. So like another example, this could be black holes. We think stellar mass black holes have one channel of formation and supermassive black holes that probably have a very different channel for formation. Yeah, that's a great example. Um, okay, good. So we really actually pointed this out. Kind of the two things we can imagine are literally some nonlinear function is happening or we have gappy or different physics happening. Um, and this happens all the time in physics. It's very rarely this linear simple cut. I wanna point out um, a different example, which is that, so, and I'm not an expert in this for the record, but um, when we think of, so AGN will have these broad um, Balmer series, so just hydrogen emission. But when you have a larger and larger uh, black hole mass, you get a broader line. That squishy broadening is not a linear transformation. It doesn't just get bigger or wider. It really gets broader. So even simple transformations like that are really challenging for PCA to deal with. It can't think of an eigen basis that describes like Balmer series in a way that linearly broadens. And I highlight, I always highlight this really wonderful paper by um, Stephen Portillo, which really illuminates like a very clear example of why one would use a nonlinear dimensionality reduction routine. And that routine is an autoencoder. Um, and that's what we'll talk about today. Are there any remaining questions on what we just talked about before we dive into how does an autoencoder work? Good. Okay, so what is an autoencoder? It is, um, I promise you have, you have basically made one. It is just a type of neural network and it's almost exactly the same as the one you made yesterday. The difference is that you are going to force that neural network to learn a low dimensional representation of your data. I will note that this is part of a broader class if you hear these terminologies of what's called representation learning, um, which I think is a nice name because it really describes what we're trying to do, right? We have big dimensional data, but we want a a representation that's low dimensional, but that we can use to describe most of what's happening. In our case, most of the physics that's going on. Um, okay, so how are we gonna tell our neural network, hey, take my data set and make it lower dimension? Let's think of this in the context of Mu. Just like the neural network we learned about yesterday, this is just a type of model, but we're going to be clever about the inputs and outputs, and therefore the objective function to optimize this, but we're still just gonna be using a stochastic gradient descent method to optimize it. And so this is honestly, <laughs> this is all an autoencoder is. I make the same multi-layer perceptron that I made yesterday, but yesterday our input was a galaxy image and our output was a classification. In this case, my input and output is going to be the exact same thing. So that sounds really silly because if my neural network was like one layer big, it could just learn to multiply my data by one and it would perfectly solve its job. Great job, neural network. Um, but we haven't done any dimensionality reduction. 
And so the trick is that we are going to add layers that systematically get smaller and then bigger. And it's like a compression is happening of the data. It says, okay, I have like a hundred, I know this isn't a hundred, I can count slightly better than that, but I have like a hundred input features, a whole spectrum or a whole galaxy image. But in the next layer, you're only gonna have 50 numbers to perfectly describe that image. And then you had better reduce that to just five numbers to describe that image. And then after you've done that, all right, I'm going to let you go back out and um, convert it back to the original reconstructed data. And then I'm going to, with every epoch, compare the reconstruction to the original data set and see how well I did. So the trick is that in training, while you're training it, um, you will let every, all of these are free parameter weights. It's allowed to learn, um, this is the way I like to think about it, it's allowed to try out all the different physical models it can write down um, and do that hard part for you. But then in test time, you're gonna tell it like, okay, now none of these are flexible. The only thing that you are allowed to really do is to figure out how to go from here to here and then here to here. And all the other neurons represent the weird physical model that the neural network had to learn to write down to do that conversion. I want to be super clear that we're not learning physics. You should not assume this is interpretable as physics. That's not what's happening. It's just an analogy. Okay. Is that clear? Good. So then what is the objective function we're going to use? Um, the most common one is just the mean squared error or this residual summed. It, it, um, intuitively, we're just literally asking, okay, give me the original data, subtract the new reconstructed data. How well did I do? So that, that's pretty straightforward, which is great. And what's also great is that this objective function, I can find the derivative of it. So I can use gradient descent to try to optimize. Um, even though we actually did use this yesterday, it was like a magical argument I didn't tell you about in the stochastic gradient descent. Um, we're gonna play with it a little bit more today, which is this constant, this, I'm sorry, this concept of momentum in our gradient descent algorithms. So like we said yesterday, the way gradient descent works is that I start somewhere, I start with some random model parameters. I see how well I did. I figure out which way it looks like it'll be better. And then I take a step in that direction. So in physics, um, and this is a loose connection, but in physics, we have this concept of momentum, where if I start moving in one direction or like rolling down a hill, it takes some force to stop me. And so we're going to also use that concept to help us have smoother paths towards the right answer. Um, and so this has been built into gradient descent algorithms that just naturally live in PyTorch. You don't actually need to know how this works in detail, but I think it's kind of fun. Um, one of the most commonly used algorithms is called ADAM. I don't think it stands for it. Maybe it stands for something. I don't know what it stands for, though. <laughs> um, is there a question? No. And so this is a lot of equations. It really doesn't matter so much. But the key point is just the fact that yesterday we wrote with, um, with, Ad <laughs> with ADAM, that's funny, with Adam Miller, <laughs> we, wrote, uh, we wrote a simple gradient descent algorithm where I said, hey, to predict what my free parameters of the, neuro, of the neural network should be, or the weights, please look at the current weights and then adjust it according to some learning rate um, and some gradient or slope. This is doing the same thing, but there's a few more free parameters in this algorithm. Um, one is loosely corresponding to the, great, the average gradient and then the other is loosely corresponding to the variance in those kind of average gradients. And so it's getting an idea of how certain am I that this is the greatest way to be going. That's often what we mean just by the concept of momentum in these algorithms. Um, so we, we touched upon this already. Uh, we're taking a step back now because in our MOO, uh, scheme, we've now identified our model, our objective function, and how we're going to optimize it. 
I'm trying to remember now what I do. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So in the, in the notebooks you'll be playing with, we're going to figure out, um, we're going to train an autoencoder. It's going to be the same galaxy data we were playing with, but we're going to figure out a few tasks that we can now do with our latent space that we've learned with the autoencoder, so the low dimensional representation. Um, I'm just going to highlight two, no, one example here which is anomaly detection that I pointed out. This is a really, really important um, field, I don't know, problem in many, many fields of astronomy. In my own field, uh, one of the issues that we're facing right now is, well, we will face, is that LSST will discover about a million supernovae every single year. We can only follow up like maybe a hundred of them. I'm not sure. Um, so we're looking at like a one in 10,000 level of quote unquote importance to the field to actually make the decision to go follow it up with very scarce resources. Um, and so, so on my little soapbox, like what I think we should often do is look for new astro or physics itself. Um, and so anomaly detection, which is agnostic to the underlying physics is a very helpful method for this task. Um, but more specifically too, in the problem that you guys looked at, which was classifying numbers, you can imagine that by building a latent space, you can see natural clusters of the letters and you can really understand um, specific examples of the data, which are in-betweeners. Things that don't clearly look like, let's see if I can even guess what these things are, hold on. Things that don't, these both look like eights. Mm, these all look strange. Oh, oh, because I should just look inside. So things that don't clearly look like between a two and a seven, for example, they're just kind of a silly line. And specifically in the notebook we'll be playing with, we use something called an isolation forest. And we looked at random forests. This is super related. Um, so a, a, a tree, a decision tree, which I think I have a much nicer picture. I do. So. A decision tree is trying to answer the question, how can I split the data so that I can classify or answer some question, but let's say classify, classify all the different types I see in my data set. An isolation forest is just asking the question, where should I draw these decision boundaries so that I can isolate uh, individual or small groups of points? And for this guy, it only took one line, right? I just had to draw him here and I had a guy by himself. But for these guys who sit in the middle, I have to draw tons of lines over and over again to isolate him. And so what happens is that um, you can really easily find the anomalies in your latent space, the low dimensional space, by training one of these isolation forests to try to make these isolating cuts in that space. And how weird you are, or the anomaly score, is inversely related to how many cuts it took to actually isolate you. And that's becoming an increasingly common technique. So then as a last point, um, there is a modification to this simple autoencoder scheme that I've been telling you about. Uh, and that's called a, well, let me state this in another way. One of the downsides of our latent space that we're learning with autoencoders is that in the real world, we unfortunately have errors and uncertainty, and there's no concept of that in what I just told you about. So one thing we really want to do is to um, include some sense of probabilistic encoding into this latent space. And variational autoencoders, which Vanessa will tell you about, help us do that. They also um, due to some properties I think you'll learn about, they're very helpful in making sure that this space you're learning has helpful physical properties. In particular, one thing that's great is that it makes continuous spaces. So in other words, I don't know if I got the best picture, but with a normal autoencoder, um, you might have, and you wanna classify different animals, let's say, Oh, these are digits. That's actually really easy. Okay, let's do digits. Um, so you are not guaranteed that all the twos will kind of show up in the same place in your latent space. And that kind of happens here. Like some of them are here and some of them are here. They can be really clustered. 
Variational autoencoders, the way they're designed is that they help you form a really smooth, continuous space, which is helpful in many physical phenomena where we expect that to be true. Um, so you'll learn about that next time. For now, I will leave a summary, take questions, and then go over the notebook. Good. Any questions? <laughs>